All right. Well, welcome to our church. I know most of you, it's okay. <laughs> Special little guest with us today, too. You see me? I see you. Yeah, I still see you. Uh-huh. <laughs> so happily have a baby in the, in the congregation. Everyone goes and pays attention to the kid, not anything else. Sorry, I'm distracting everybody, aren't I? Well, today we're going to be talking about fruit of the Spirit and um, kind of coming from a different angle today because we've been talking about this this last, you know, couple months, three, four, for a while now, right? And um, this idea that we're trying to become this community that we kind of look after each other and then walk through faith with one another and encourage one another, right? And that's kind of the, that's the intent of, I don't know if that's the intent of church, but the intent of community, this idea that we know each other and are being known by, each, by other people, and we're kind of walking together to seek God. And that's kind of what the three subpoints are, right? You know, seeking to know and love God, growing in relationship with God and one another by walking through life uh, with each other, and then going on mission with God. Right? It's all, there's all these things that we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to be together, right? Kind of be united in how we're pursuing God. And in the midst of that, if you kind of think about, well, what's kind of undergirding? What's kind of, what's the unspoken thing that's kind of links all these things together? And it's this. And right? one of the key components in all this is the Holy Spirit. Because right? if we don't have the Spirit, we don't get linked together. Right? The Spirit works in us and helps us to become believers in God. And then when we do that, you know, we get adopted into God's family. Right? And, that's, and hopefully that desire to follow God because of the Holy Spirit it's, you know, it impels us, it compels us to seek after God. And then if you figure out, oh, there's other people walking with me. And then how do we grow? Well, if the Holy Spirit doesn't teach us what God is going to say or what God says, then it's kind of hard to grow. Um, and then also for mission, right? So if I had to list out all the things the Holy Spirit does, and we kind of talked over some of these, but not all of them, but they're kind of mixed into some of the messages, right? And so the Holy Spirit, right, indwells the believer at conversion, that when we believe in God, that the Holy Spirit, well, before we believe in God, actually the Holy Spirit's working in us, um, kind of helping us become soft towards God. And then when we believe, you know, then he, compl- he, he lives in us. The Bible says we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, right? He lives in us. And then he gives us energy for ministry. We talked about that like three weeks ago. He gives us gifts to complete ministry, right? The spiritual gifts. Um, and in the midst of all doing all that, he makes us more like Jesus, right? He makes us more holy. That's, that's, we've talked through these things in different places at different times, right? One of the things the Holy Spirit does is that he gives us God's thoughts. And at 1 Corinthians, we talked that last year sometime, that we can know the mind of God because we have the Spirit of God living in us. And this idea that we know exactly what God wants because he tells us. Right? And then the last one is that, of the many things he does, he, does, he and this is out of Romans 8, right? he helps us to pray. He talks about the help spirit prays with us or for us with, with groans, um, not, with groans not understandable by, by human ears or something. Right? This idea that he's praying, he helps us to pray, and not only does he help us, he also prays for us. Um, so these are all the things the Holy Spirit does. So if we don't have the Holy Spirit, you know, all the things we want to do, seeking God and loving other people and going on mission, doesn't happen, right? We need the Holy Spirit. But then the question comes, how do we know all this is true? Because these are, I don't, I don't know if the right term is, they're, they're propositions, they're statements of fact, but then how do I know that it is actually true, right? I mean, I like to be a nice logical person. <laughs> you can tell me all these statements, but if it's not really true, like you can say, well, gravity is what, 9.8 meters squared, meters squared oh, per second squared fall, acceleration down to the earth. How do I know that's true? Well, if I drop something and I actually measure it out correctly, I could actually calculate it out. Okay? So if the Holy Spirit's in you, we should have some kind of proof, right? Because what proves that we have the Holy Spirit? Again, it's, it's almost like this idea of uh, when, towards the end of our career trip, actually I was at the, was at the uh, airport, I was walking around pushing the, the cart of luggage around because we got there really early. I was like, man, I'm really tired. I don't know why I'm so feeling so tired. Got a slight cough. Yeah, I know where this is going, right? And you're like, oh, this is, what's going on? Okay, so anyway, long story short, get to Hawaii, test myself. Hey, I got COVID. But it's symptoms, 
right? If you have the Holy Spirit, there should be, I don't want to say symptoms, kind of a weird way to put it, but there should be some evidence that he's there. Because that's what happens. If you get a splinter, what happens? You start getting a little, well, sometimes you don't even know you have a splinter, right? Sometimes you're doing something, it's like, oh, well, something a little sore there. And you start looking at it, oh, yeah, you guys start looking at far the way to get older you get. And you go, oh, there's a splinter there. And you go, oh, okay, I got to go get it out. Whatever it may be. So there's, there's symptoms, there's signs to show you that something is right or wrong um, in you. So let's look. Let's look at some passages to talk about. And this is coming from, again, fruit of the Spirit. We're looking at from the point of the perspective of saying, if the Holy Spirit's in you, there should be some symptoms. There should be something there to show that he's there. And some out of Galatians, and I'm sure, well, I know you guys know the fruit of spirit passage, but we're starting a little ahead of it. Um, verse 16, so I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Um, probably the first thing to note is that word sinful nature in the NIV, if you're using a different translation like the New American Standard, you'll, hear the, you'll see the word flesh. I, I, I'm not sure what the, some of the other translations might use. Um, but the idea of sinful nature is actually, let's use the word flesh because it's a little easier to understand, I think. It's everything, it encompasses everything a person could be without God. Right? So it encompasses everything a person could be without God. So the NIV, they call it dynamic translation. They're taking it and saying, well, this is a better, maybe a different way to understand that concept. And so the sinful nature, I think if we could understand it, it's, right, it's everything a person could be apart from God. So no matter how good they are or how bad they are, all of that just comes from living apart from God. And so the first comment we can make here is that you as an individual, as a, as a believer, have both the spirit and the flesh kind of inside of you. I mean, just because we've become believers doesn't mean that our sinful nature has been taken away. Um, here's, a, here's one way to understand it. Before we knew Christ, before we know, become believers, we have this pulley system, if you will. And it goes from you at the bottom, and it goes up, and you have sin, at least impurity, wickedness, and death, right? That's the Romans... Uh, Romans wrote, right? Romans 3.23, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Okay, so that's, that's what we have before we know God. And that's the idea of flesh. And if you read through the Bible in different places, it would be called sinful nature or old self or old creation. Okay, upon belief, when we believe in Jesus, we get the cross. And it kind of, it doesn't remove this, but it, 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 it disables the system. And at the same time, does it disable the system? It also creates this new system, which we call you know, obedience, righteousness, holiness, eternal life. And right? for those, they, when you believe in Jesus Christ, uh, you've been eternal life. And, and although it says spirit at the top, it's sort of like, they wouldn't call it spirit, but it's like, it's your spiritual nature. It's your new self. It's a new creation. Again, if you look at through different Bible passages, you'll see that wording. And you can say it's like a spirit-led life. Right, so basically, if you go back to the bottom dot, once you become a believer, you now have a choice of whether to sin or to not sin. It means that we can actually, if you will, pull out the cross of Christ and we can still use that pulley system. Um, it's still there in us, but when we have Christ and we focus on living out what he wants us to do, it kind of disables that system. It gives us the opportunity to actually choose. Right, before this, you had no choice. Right? You had no choice but to sin. When you have Christ, you now have a choice of whether you want to sin or not. And that's what this passage is talking about. Right? Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. Right? It's like focus on Christ and you won't sin. Um, but to, we have to know before that that we both have both the, the flesh and the spiritual way of doing things in us. And we have to know that they conflict. Kind of like oil and water. Light and dark. Good and evil. I don't know whatever other binary combination you want. But they contrast with each other. Like fire and water, no matter what happens, you know, it's going to contrast because they are completely opposite each other. And so know that, but where does this all happen? It happens in your mind. 
right? When it says, hey, do I follow God now or do I do whatever I want to do? Right? That's usually how the thought comes out. Actually, usually the thought comes out more, I feel like God is saying this to me, and then you can decide whether you want to follow it. The sin side actually sounds more like this. It says, hey, it'd be really nice if you did this. Or, you really, it'd be really fulfilling if you did this. Or you, you'd really um, like it if you did this. And then sometimes when you follow those thoughts, we go, actually, you didn't really like that as much as I thought I did. It was not as satisfying as I thought it was, or whatever it may be. All right, so this is how you, kinda, you can identify the conflict. It's, it's never a, yeah, let's go do this to you know, the opposite God. It's more like, hey, you should really you know, please yourself or treat yourself. Uh, for example, I went to a sunglass shop one day, and I, I was trying to buy sunglasses. And the way that the salesperson put it, it said, um, you should really get this. You really deserve it. I don't deserve this. It's like $125 sunglasses. I don't really deserve this. I didn't buy it. But that's how it sounds in our minds. That's what sin sounds like. You really deserve this. You really, you earned this. Or you really need this time. Or you need to keep going. You know, it's like taking a half hour break on your phone. Oh, that was so much good. Let's take another hour. Let's take another, another half hour. Just another video. And then an hour later, hour and a half later, man, I didn't get to do what I really needed to do. And you feel really terrible about it. Okay, that's all the sinful nature. It's, it's in us. It's always there, whether we're aware of it or not. And that's kind of where we have to ask the Spirit, say, or the or God or the Holy Spirit, say, hey, help me to catch those things. Because it's very easy to, to go down that road. And so that's, how, that's the, the line right before verse 18, right? They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. So for some of you who've read your Bibles, you kind of know that comes out of this passage in Romans. It's Romans 7. It talks about how the, the flesh and the spirit, they're always opposing each other. And Paul actually says this about himself. I, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, so that I have the desire to do what is good, right? I want to do good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do, or for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. And yeah, there's a lot of twisted logic in there, but basically it's, we know the good that we want to do, we know we want to follow God, but in the moment of us recognizing that, we do the complete opposite. Right? I don't want to keep looking at the video, but the next cat video looked really cool. I don't watch videos a lot. I try not to because I, I know I'll go down that path. Actually, I don't like having a TV on. I figured that out in college. If I leave the TV on, I'll just keep watching it all day. It's like, I don't know why that is. It just happens. So, yeah, I try to keep it off. That's the sin living in us. We want to do better. We want to live a different way, but that sin is there. Um, so what's the, how do we get out of that, right? That's, that's the real question. How do we get out of that? And, as our passage was saying, um, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. You know, live by the Spirit and you not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. You now have a choice. You didn't have a choice before, but now you have a choice. You can choose to follow God. You don't have to sin anymore. You don't have to get tempted by those. Well, you always be tempted. Whether you sin or not, that's now an option. So you can choose to live by the Spirit. And when you choose to live by the Spirit, you can overcome the flesh and not sin. For me, the way I understand that is, there's a desire to play on my phone. And sometimes that takes me away from things I need to do. If I don't choose to open up the game on my phone and focus on my work, I'm actually pretty good. I can focus on what I need to do. And it actually works out really well. Um, but the moment I say, oh, hey, let me take a short break. Okay, one game, turn it off. Okay, put it away. Otherwise, we keep going. Choosing to be led by the Spirit because you know what you need to do. You can overcome the flesh. God gives you the power and the strength. Right? He energizes you. He gives you gifts. He's doing all this so that you can live a victorious life. I don't say victorious is maybe too strong a word sometimes, but it's you can live the life that He desires for you. Right? And that you don't have to sin, but you need to recognize that you are being tempted. You need to recognize when you have that choice, or that you always have a choice. Sometimes we don't think we have a choice. We just get pushed in by circumstances. But you always have a choice to not sin. 
And that is by, you do that by focusing on what God desires for you and saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this way. Right? But so how do we know if we're being led by the Spirit or we're stuck being led by our flesh? And you can also use this test for yourself, but you can also use it for other people. Right? The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, uh, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, uh, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not, in, will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, and this, this list is not a extensive, it's not a, what's it? This, it's not meant to be this is all there is, right? There's more than that, it's like, and the like, right? So we the word etc. But these are different uh, lists that you can look at and go, well, what exactly is it? I mean, what are some of the things uh, that might denote that I'm not following God, that I'm being controlled by something that I don't want to be? Um, so way to understand it, these are like self-evident things. The first three are, they call it violations of sexual law, sexual immorality, you know, se different sexual, illicit sexual relationships. Um, impurity means doing it in the sight of, in the public. And then debauchery just means uh, again, more in the public. Right? The other ones are idolatry and sorcery. These are sins linked to usually pagan religions, but it's also idolatry. When you put something up on a pedestal, we, think we, we spend more time thinking about it than we think about God. We start depending on that thing more than we depend on God. That's idolatry. Like, you know, if we depend on, you know, what is future happiness for us? Is it, is it money? Reputation, fame, you know, a house, or is it, okay, God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Right? Idolatry. Idolatry, we think that something will satisfy us or fulfill whatever um, ambitions we have. And then the next, uh, so the next eight are just how you interact with people socially, the social, social nature of human relationships. Right? Is there hatred? Discord is fighting. Uh, jealousy is... Jealousy is because someone else has something more than you, right? You want what they have. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Right? These are all different words to describe the social nature of sin. And the interesting thing about the social nature of sin is that sometimes we will take, we will put certain actions, certain visible public actions um, higher, right? We'll put them at a higher scale than the pride, the... And, you know, the ambition that's hiding behind the surface. You know, we, we sometimes tag more of these things than the ones on the bottom, the, the, the more private ones. And that's not, that's not appropriate, if you will. That's not something we should be doing. Because um, they're all sin before God. Um, some are more public, but we don't always, you know, point out, hey, you're being really prideful or whatnot. Okay, so the acts of the flesh itself, and at the same time, it also shows this. It shows one's allegiance. Right? So the very last line, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So understand, you should understand it like this. It's not that they were saved, and then they acted out improperly, and they said, okay, sorry, you have now, you, you, hit, the, you hit your three strikes, or you, you hit the minimum standard, so you're out. Okay? That's not how you should be reading this, this passage. Rather, it's that those who live like this, those who have a, show a, a continual habit to do this, like you're, it's not just a once in a while thing where you, oh, yeah, you got sucked into that argument and then you said some things you shouldn't. Okay, that's, but normally you're okay, right? That, that's a, it's, it's not a something a habitual thing. It's like every once in a while, like, oh, okay, okay. And then you go back and apologize because you, you said things that you shouldn't have. But this is more those who live like this, who have a continual practice. Um, the idea of the word live there also is the, word, is the idea of the word walk or practice, that you keep doing this all the time. For those who live like this all the time, it shows that they are not ruled by God. Right? It shows that they basically are Christians in name only, that they don't actually have, they have not accepted God's rule over their life. And that's, the word, that's why I use the word allegiance. It shows your allegiance. Are you, 
you may say I'm allegiance to this country or this, you know, whatever this, this principle or whatever it may be, but when you actually live out your life and you look at the deeds of your life, you're like, well, they actually aren't, you know, they actually don't follow that. It's this idea of saying, um, if I'm supposed to be a citizen of heaven, which means that God has rule over me, and because I'm trying to follow God's rules, my life will look a certain way. But if my life doesn't look that way, it just shows that I never was under God's rule in the first place. Right? So this is, again, you know, Jesus, Jesus talks about false teachers at one point in time. I think Matthew 7. And it says, you know a tree by its fruit. And so you look at the false teachers and what they do, they say, hey, I, I, I cast out demons. I, I did all this in your name. And then Jesus at the very end says, oh, I never knew you. Because right? there's all these things you're doing, but you actually didn't submit yourself to me. You just like doing all those things. And for us, when we talk about Christianity, we talk about our faith, is in this case, for us who believe, it's a warning. Right? I warn you, look at your life, examine it. Are you actually allowing God to rule in your life? Or are you not? Because if you're not, and you live that as a way of life, it just shows that you aren't a believer. Um, I, I gave you the, I put the New, Amer New, New Living Translation up because it, it does some interpretations. The New Living Translation is a, a paraphrase of what the original language is, but it, it's a slightly different flavor. It also helps be a little easier to read at times, a little more understanding. Let me read it for you. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. A sexual immorality, immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except for those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, it's this idea that it's, it's a living thing, right? It's your lifestyle, the, the, your way of life. If, it's, if you have these things and it keeps to be the... When people think of you, you go, yeah, that's you? <laughs> it's not a good thing, right? Again, I bring this up as a way, because God doesn't call us not to judge other people. It's just, he just says, make sure that you look at your own self first before you look at other people. <laughs> This is how we should be measuring to see if the Holy Spirit is in ourselves and, and maybe even other people. Okay, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay, and it's this. Proof of having and being led by the Spirit is fruit. That when we follow God, that these things start appearing in our lives. And again, it's, don't think of this as, a, as one commentator put it, it's like, don't think of it as a perpetual motion machine, that these things just get created out of nothing, as if you were, you could sit still and not follow God, and then God just sort of miraculously changes your heart and changes your mind. It's like, that's not how that works. Um, instead, it's kind of this. This idea of, this, of being led is this, they call it passive active reaction, or passive active action. It's like, how do you become passive and active at the same time? Um, I, I kind of link it to this idea. The picture that, in the background there is my tomato plants. <laughs> I grew them from the tomatoes from Costco and the, the, the tomato medley. I took it out, put it, I, I saved it so that we would not eat it. And at, that, at some point in time, it got old enough that I cut into a bunch of square or you know, quarters and stuck it in the ground. And it took a long time. And, you know, I kind of grew up, had to figure out which plants I wanted, stuck them in other pots. Uh, I was thinking I should take a picture week by week next time so I could figure out how, how long it took. <laughs> Finally, there are fruit. And, but what did it take to get the fruit? You have to provide soil and water. You guys know some parables about soil maybe? Soil, four soil types, the ones, the, the hard packed soil, the soil that got into was it, the rocky ground, soil that landed amongst thorns, and there's good soil. Right, this idea, and the whole point of that parable seems to be, well, at least one aspect of the parable, is that 
each person's heart, how receptive they are to the Word of God, right? That's something you can do something about, right? How receptive are you to the Word of God? Um, that's soil. But what is water? Well, water is, at least in my mindset, it's the Word of God. How do you water something? How can you learn what God wants if you don't read the Bible? You have to water it so that it can, uh, God grows it, but you have to water it. Actually, this is what Paul says to the Corinthian church, because there are divisions, they're fighting against each other, because I'm from, uh, I'm from Paul, I'm from Apollo, so I'm, I'm going to be real spiritual, I'm from Christ, right? That's, that's if you read the first part of the Corinthians. And, and Paul says, yeah, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God made it grow. It's this fruit of the Spirit, you're receptive to God, you hear God's voice, you choose to follow God, right? I did mean led by God. You choose to follow God. And as a result of you choosing to follow God, God then grows things in you. Proof of having and being led by the Spirit is fruit. That you're receptive to what God is doing and saying in your life. As you follow him, passive, right? You're not doing something else. You're, you're responding to what God is doing. That's the passive side. Active side is that you are choosing to do that. <laughs> right? That we can't produce on our own. We don't, we don't produce fruit on our own. We can't force ourselves to produce the fruit. But God, when he gives us a spirit and starts saying, hey, do this, do that, you'll see fruit in your life. I think back to when I was a first, as a young believer, I didn't have a, became a believer senior year, my um, senior, summer after my senior year, had no church to go to. I went to the University of Washington, had no church to go to there, couldn't find one. I didn't know anything about different um, fellowship groups, totally new to being a Christian on my own. And the only thing I could figure out was I, my, my godmother said, read your Bible every day. Okay. And at some point I figured out, oh, I should probably start putting these things, putting to practice some of these things I'm reading. And when I did that, I was like, oh, it kind of works. And I, I, there was a point in time where I was like, well, I literally felt like, oh, I'm getting less angry. And it was like, well, it was a one year span. I, was like, I started to put these into practice. A year later, I was like, I'm a little less angry. A year after that, oh, I'm even a lot less angry. Those are the experiential sides of faith, right? That's the proof side of faith that says, hey, when you follow God and you're willing to put his things into action, you get to see things happen in your life. Do you see yourself being more loving to those around you, right? That you can love them beyond what you loved them before. Um, the word joy there is this idea that you have joy even if the circumstances aren't very fun, but you feel like, well, yeah, God placed me here. And so there's a joy of the Lord that doesn't match up to the surrounding circumstances. Like, oh, very interesting. Peace. Right? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts. This idea that Jesus gives us his peace, that somehow in the midst of, again, crazy circumstances around us, whatever it may be, that God gives us a sense of peace because you sense, oh, that God is, God is here with me. And God maybe even placed me here. And that, that's a weird phrase, that God placed you there. Think of the disciples. Hey, let's go across the other side. Jesus falls asleep. What happens? Storm comes. The disciples are like, Jesus, save us. <laughs> Who told them to go across the lake? Jesus. Where'd the storm come from? Don't know. We could talk about where the storm came from. They ran into the storm. Jesus could have told them, go another day. Go around. Take a walk. Go across the lake. God might put you in a place where you are forced to experience his peace or maybe his patience. Right? Patience, the idea of long suffering, that even when you're dealing with, you're putting up with people and you're not liking it, but you're putting up with them and you're not retaliating against them. If you've never done that in your life and all of a sudden you start feeling that you need to be doing that, that's the Spirit of God speaking to you. Uh, kindness, the idea of being, just being good to one another. Goodness is sort of the, related to kindness, they're kind of the same. Um, faithfulness, when you start doing projects and you start doing things and you are seeking to be a faithful person. Um, gentleness is when you are allowed, you know, Galatians 6, we talked about that. When someone's caught in sin, those of you who are gentle, uh, those of you who are spiritual, be gentle. With them. We restore them in gen all gentleness. This idea that my personality is very hard, actually, because <laughs> I'm a very dis disciplined person. It's like, I told you once, told you twice, all right, too bad. <laughs> Gentle. I had to learn how to be gentle once I had kids because I couldn't do that all the time. 
I mean, I had a wife who was a little more sensitive than I. So I learned how to be gentle. And then self-control. I'm sure you guys understand what self-control is. And when we see those things in our lives that it's probably not us, that's like, hey, I start seeing those things building up in my life or things that are appearing in my life that I didn't think of or see, be, think of or see before. They weren't like patterns in my life. When you start seeing those patterns in your life and you re- kind of track it back to, oh, I'm trying to follow what God is saying. And it's hard, but I'm trying to follow him. And you start seeing these things appear in your life. Then you can, in a sense, prove to yourself that what God is saying is true because you know that the Holy Spirit is allowing this fruit to, is producing this fruit in you. Again, we can't produce this fruit yourself. I mean, no matter how patient I try to be in my own flesh, I just can't. It just, it comes out after a while. Um, but when I realize and I can see how God gives me more patience when I try to be patient, it's like, okay, you know, God's there. The Holy Spirit is in me. He is working. I'm making sure that I follow him. And then the last part of this passage is, those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Why does all this work? You know, go back to that first couple of slides I had where you had the two pulley system. It goes, Jesus goes beyond just kind of disabling the pulley system. He actually says that we have died with Christ. This is out of Romans 6. You know, the idea of baptism, you've died with Christ. That's why they dip you in the water and they pull you back out. That's the idea of living by the Spirit. This idea that our old selves, we are to think of it as dead. Right? It's no longer, it's not supposed to be a good angel on one shoulder, evil angel on the other shoulder trying to convince you. We're actually supposed to think, my old self, my old way of doing things, my old thought patterns, all of that is dead. I should not be allowing that to influence in me. Instead, I should be living by the Spirit. I should be focused on what God wants for me, and I should be following Him. That's what it means to be led by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. You know, the idea of live again is the idea of walking by the Spirit, that we are in step by step with the Spirit to follow God, right? Because if, if we have died with this, died, if our old self has died, and a new life is brought alive by the Holy Spirit, then the only way we can live is by the Spirit, right? We live by the Spirit. That, that's our source of life. And that therefore, if we're living by the Spirit, then the words um, keep in step, it means get in line. And I use the word align so that we should walk with the Spirit, be step in step with Him. It's like walking in a march, right? You try to coordinate your steps so you look kind of cool because you're all stepping with your right foot first. Sometimes it just happens, I think. <laughs> But it's the idea that we are choosing to follow God. We're choosing to align with how the Spirit is leading us. As we read our Bibles, as God brings to mind certain things, we go, oh, this is how I should be living. Let me focus on that. Right? And the last part of that says, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. We, we might become conceited because we're saying, look how good I am. Look how much better I've gotten. And we become proud about it, but we forget that we shouldn't be proud about the fruit that's being produced in us because that's God working in us. That's not us. Right? We sometimes become proud because, oh, I'm doing so well, so spiritually mature. And we forget that it's not you. It's God working in you. And sometimes we see others who should be doing better, right? As one commentator put it, they should be able to carry the load they've been given, but they're failing at it. And we look at them and say, oh, I'm better than you. How come you can't do better? And God says, no, that's not what you're supposed to be saying. You need to be gentle, <laughs> encouraging them. Um, idea of provoking, that kind of falls into the idea of provoking, right? You take poking at them. Another passage, another, another, uh, another translation says irritating them, seeking to irritate somebody else. And this idea that when we see that we are walking with God and God is producing fruit in us, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to other people. Right? The only race you're running is between you and God. How are you matching up to the race God has set out before you? You can encourage me on my race, but you can't be criticizing me for my race. We only get that when we understand that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Right? 
when we listen to his words and we say, okay, how do I need to speak? How do I need to act? How do I need to behave? What attitudes do I need to change? What things are you saying to me that maybe I need to stop doing? What things am I not doing that maybe I need to start? When we start asking God all of these things and we can kind of sense his speaking into our lives. And some of that comes through scripture. Some of that comes to talking with other people. Some of that just means you pray and you wait for a minute or two and say, okay, okay, God, what do you want to say to me? And whatever thought comes back to you, you go, okay, it lines up with scripture. It's not illegal. <laughs> it, it seems to be a plausible thing I can do, or it seems to be something that I can't see anything wrong with it. Try it. See what the Spirit of God says to you. See where he leads you. He's not going to say, he's not going to lead you to violate anything that God commands, okay? But he may take you on a different route than maybe that you're on. But you have to be sensitive. You have to listen. Be willing to be led by the Spirit. And again, I'm not talking about going off and doing crazy things. I mean, it might be, but usually not. Um, but it comes down to asking, God, what would you have for me? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to speak? How, do you, what, how would you want me to treat this person next to me? And when you ask those things, sometimes God speaks. Now it's up to us to respond to that. Passive, active action. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for being an awesome God that you always try to speak to us. Um, whether we respond to you, whether we always listen, that's, that's always in question. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that you're God that speaks. And may we hear your voice, Lord. May we seek to be led by you. And when you put those choices before us, when you when you put the choice to, um, yeah, to, to do it our way, to, to live out their old life, maybe recognize that and that we choose to follow you instead. And Lord, we know that you are a, an awesome and thankful God. You know, or we thank you that you are an awesome God, that um, this isn't another set of rules to follow, but rather it's a spirit, it's a person, it's a relationship to have with you. May you strengthen that relationship. May you prove to us that you are there, that you are real, that you love us. Lord, we thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen.